I'm excited to welcome this week's Tierra Talk Show guest, screenwriter Dave Reynolds to the show. Welcome, Dave. Hey, how are you? Thanks it's nice to have you. Yes, I. this has been the year of Atlantis for me because it's 20 years and it's like my favorite Disney film ever. And right. I really wanted to talk to you about it today. And it was sure. fun to kind of go through your, your background because you have so many different credits a lot of right. Disney things that I love and that don't get right. a lot of recognition. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I thought it would be interesting because I found that first you started in the entertainment industry as an actor and then moved into writing for the late night show at Conan O'Brien. So right. can you tell me right. like what inspired you to get into entertainment and act first? Um, well, I was, I grew up in Chicago and I'm one of six kids, so there's a lot of <laughs> you got a lot of acting to do just to kind of stay out of trouble. Um, and so uh, when I got out of college, I I ended up just fluke. I got into taking um, improv classes at Second City in Chicago. And when I was there, I met a couple people, and we uh, later formed an improv group. And that was, I met Robert Smigel. If you know Robert Smigel from. Triumph the Insult Comic Dog and all the Saturday Night Live stuff and Bob Odenkirk and Jill Talley and a bunch of people. And we sort of formed a, an improv group and that the, the we ran for like a year and a half. We had a show that was uh, sort of like the number one sketch show in Chicago other than Second City. And um, and then through that, I kind of got a little bit of work and did a little movie stuff and um, came out to Los Angeles and um, when I came out to Los Angeles, <clears throat> it's a little different story out here as far as like being an actor and you're unique in Chicago or wherever your hometown is. And then you walk into a room and you see I literally walked into a room once and I saw eight guys that looked more like me than my brothers. I mean, it was just you. I said, how do you choose? You know, there's so many people out here. But I'd always liked writing and I and through improvisation, you know, the the sketch show that I did with Robert Smigel. Um, we actually improv did improvisational writing in order to form the sketches. And so, you know, you don't realize when you're doing it that you're actually writing. And so once I came out here and sort of figured out I didn't want to be an actor, I started to write. Now, at the mean, in the meantime, Robert had moved on to Saturday Night Live and uh, it was winning Emmys over there. And uh, and then I kind of. Uh, morphed into and I we, you know we've always been friends and I uh he came out one time and he says listen we're going to start this call and I knew I had met Conan O'Brien and he said we're going to start the uh late night would you want to be a writer on that and uh I said oh yeah <laughs> so um in 93 I went out and uh, I was one of the original writers on late night with Conan so we went through that I was there for the first two years like like 400 shows and as you can imagine, that was pretty intense, but it was fun. And uh, it really taught me how to uh, how to write. And it really taught me that uh, you can write anything uh, quickly, right? You can never, when you have a late night show like that, then we were producing a lot of comedy at the time. Um, you could not afford to be uh, blocked. You could not have writer's block. You just couldn't because we were doing a show every day at 530. And there were six writers and we were five shows a week and we were doing four to five pieces of comedy per show. So you just the math of it was you had to produce and you had to be flexible. And so that's how I learned how to write. And I learned how to write quickly. And and if something's not working, you move on and you move to the next thing or, or try to figure out another way to fix it. And so after a couple of years, you know, uh, I came back here. I left the show. It was just that show was just. It was just very difficult show to, to maintain the, the pace after we had started. it. So I came back out here and I thought I was going to get on a sitcom. You know, there was the mid 90s. I thought it was, you know, Friends and Seinfeld. I knew people on those shows. And I was waiting to sort of like meet the staff on those shows when my agent said, hey, do you want to go over and work at um, uh, Walt Disney Feature Animation? And uh, they need some right. They need some help uh, punching up some some movies. So. Um, Sure. I went over there and I uh, met um, all the folks. I met, uh, you know, all the executives there. And they said, hey, wh why don't you come work with us on Tarzan? 
So I came over and uh, started working on Tarzan. And then once I got on, you know, the process and we could talk about the pro- well, you probably through tab, you've talked about the process. Um, and, you know, once you write stuff for animation, you know, it goes to a storyboard artist and it comes back to you and it goes back. So there's a lot of time in between uh, when you hand off pages. And I'm used to this late night, you know, sort of fast paced way of writing so i uh i just said to them do you have anything else do you have any do you have any other things going on because i have time in my day and um so then they started moving me on i started doing uh some rewriting for uh mulan i did writing for atlantis and then but i also had before that or actually before that during that i met um this young upstart company up in the bay area called pixar and that was really sort of like my first or second big job was um, they asked me to kind of help develop and start the writing process on a bug's life. And that was a funny, that, that happened in a funny way because I didn't know anything about Pixar. I didn't know anything about Toy Story. No one knew anything about Toy Story. It was a secret, you know, except to, to them. And um, so what happened was that uh, an executive took me and she said, you know, these guys we work with up in the Bay area uh, they're really fun and funny. I think you'd get, you'd like them. And uh, they have this movie called Toy Story. And I said, what's it about? And then they sort of told me it's about these two toys and they're on the road and blah, 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 and all this stuff. And I said, oh, OK. And so they showed me a picture. They literally held up a still picture of Woody and Buzz, you know, sitting on a shelf or something. So like, and um, from the movie. And um, I said, oh, that's that's great. Now, remember, this is 1995. And I, I said, oh, so what is it? What do they look like in the movie? And they said, and she says, well, they look like this. I go, I no, 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 no. When they're animated, what do they look like in the movie? And, and she went, this is from the movie. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. And they, they said, you have to understand this technology that they're developing up there, this computer animated technology is unbelievable. And you're never going to, it's going to blow your head off. And I just was like, all right, whatever. I still didn't understand because at that time, you have to think you, you're, you know, I tell you, you're too young for this. But there was like it was it was like Donkey Kong and uh, Tron, the first Tron movie. That was the only thing that we knew of as far as being computer animated. There was nothing, uh, especially in animation, uh, CGI, you know, anything. So um, I had a meeting. I had a meeting with uh, <clears throat> uh, John Lasseter, Andrew Stanton, Pete Doctor, a bunch of guys, all these like. You know, crazy guys look like they're rolled out of a frat house. They come down. We have this hilarious meeting, a couple hours. And at the end of it, John just goes, hey, you want to help us out in Bugs Life? I went, sure. And so, um, like, the next week, I was on a plane up to Oakland because Point Richmond, before they went to Emory, Emeryville, they were in this uh, sort of business warehouse called uh, in an area called Point Richmond, right near a refinery. And um, I kind of come in. I meet Andrew Stanton. And uh, we get we got along great, and we're, he's joking around. And we're walking around, and they're showing me all this stuff of, at Pixar. They're showing me a render farm. They're showing me this, and they showed me this render farm, which looked like twenty refrig- black refrigerators. And they go, "Look at this. We have this." And I say, "Awesome!" But I didn't know what it was. I didn't even know what I was looking at. But they seemed to be excited about, you know, what it did. And so then I'm. Uh, so I'm there for a while, and all of a sudden, for like about a half hour, Andrew Stanton says, says, do you know what we do up here? I went, no, not really. Really don't. And he goes, wait, you took a job with us, and you don't know what we do up here? I said, no, you all seem like really fun guys. The people at Disney seem to like you. So I just said, sure, let's, you know, let's go with that. And so then he took me, and I'll, be, I'll wrap this up, but he took me into this um, screening room, and um he said to somebody who was behind a big computer, he says, so what do we have in here? And uh, lo- loaded up. And it was a, th- a screening room. And he said, um, yeah, the birthday party. So they just press a button on a computer, which was weird to me that there wasn't like a projector behind me, whatever it was. And up popped the uh, the birthday party from Andy's, uh, Andy's birthday party. And it was the uh, army men um, spying on, on the birthday party. And... I literally, you have to imagine, this is 1995, no one else other than the people at Pixar or people that they told me had seen what I was about to see. 
And so I'm like, okay, whatever. And I see it. And my jaw literally was like, why? I was just, I couldn't, I was staggered. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Right. And stunned. So obviously Andrews, those guys are so funny and smart. Right. Right. As I'm literally, my eyes are bugging out. He leans over and he goes, we want you to help us uh, do this with uh, Bugs Life. Are you in? I go, dude, I'm in. I'm moving up here. This is the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. I want to. And then, of course, the, you know, the clip ends. And I was like, I want to see the rest of this. And um, so anyway, after that happened, uh, I would travel back and forth between Oakland and, and L.A. And also at the same time, then they I was introduced to the Tarzan people, as I said. And then so I was kind of working on both movies. So I was working on I was working on A Bug's Life and then I was working on Tarzan. And then uh, Bugs Life, they kind of handed it off and they were they were getting moving. They had some other writers come up to work on it full time and live up there. I stayed down here. And so when I was on Tarzan and Bugs Life and here, then they said, hey, uh, Don Hahn said, you want to come look at uh, Atlantis? Anyway. Well, it, it's interesting. So you're 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 training basically your your lead up and working at the Conan O'Brien show with the timing mm -hmm. was really quick. Now for Mulan, I see that you have a credit there, and I yep. know that most of the production was in Florida. Right. But you were you were working out in CA, or did you get to go to the Florida studio? No, to see no, it? I was here. I was here, <laughs> and. Um, what and and this again? Everything I tell you, it's almost like I'm telling you something from the old west. Like I, we we fax things. <laughs> you know yes, what I mean? yeah. We fax things. So I was rewriting uh, Mulan, and when I my main co contribution to Mulan was the Mushu character, Eddie Murphy's character. I rewrote pretty much all of that, and um, it was a certain way. And I just kind of came in, and 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 because it was targeted. You know, when they would go, um, and the funniest part of it was I'm in a little studio apartment in L.A. I write my stuff for Mulan, or for Mushu, basically, in Mulan. I would fax it to the Florida studio. The Florida studio would then turn around and fax it to New Jersey because they, you know, the the directors and, and the producers would fly to New Jersey to Eddie Murphy's uh, mansion because he has a recording studio in his mansion. And so he would, so it was literally, it was like pinging all over the country. So I would fax it to them. Somebody would literally take it out of the fax machine, turn around, put it back in, and then zip it off to the East Coast, uh, up the coast to, uh, and then they would get it, you know, and that's how, and that's how I was, that's how I was working in real time with the production. So I, I did, Mostly the Mushu stuff because they had a lot of good people. You know, you know Chris Sander was, was on that. Dean Dubois and you know Chris Williams and John Sanford and those guys down in Florida. They were the story people. The storyboard guys down there were fantastic. They're you know they, they've all come out of there and they're proven directors and writers. So they were handling the majority of it. But there was a thing with the Mushu stuff that either just was falling through the cracks or the directors just wanted other takes. And I kind of found a kind of a niche with uh, Mushu's voice. And I just knew the way that Eddie could do it. So um, I just ended up write, rewriting a lot of that. So now, how, how would that work for A Bug's Life? Because that's actually one of my favorite Pixar films. I, I feel like because it's squished in between Toy Story and to Toy Story 2, it right. doesn't get the recognition. But my favorite thing about most of these films, and I think Atlantis comes in, into play with this too, is that it's a, right. a group of characters. And right. that's the fun part of the interaction. So right. what did you work on specifically for that? All right. So when I met up with those guys, I came up and Toy Story, like I met with the Pixar folks in uh, April or May of 95. And then the movie Toy Story wasn't coming out till uh, November. So, the, so nobody had seen the movie. And, and so John Lasseter was, you know, doing finishing touches and, doing early press and all that stuff. So I worked with Andrew Stanton and Robert Lenz, who's the head of story. And then I, with Pete Doctor, who was a storyboard artist and Jason Katz and all these guys. And we just, they had some rough ideas of what the show was going to be about. You know, Seven Samurai, you know, the, the, you know, the guy who mistakenly hires a group that he thinks are warriors, 
all that sort of stuff. And, you know, I went up there. I went up. There, I would I would shuttle back and forth. I would go up there for a couple of days and come back and and we would talk on the phone and we would, again, fax things to each other and I would write pages and then I'd have to shoot them up to them. And so what we were doing is we were just trying to build we were trying to build the uh, the team. We were trying to build, you know, Flix group and and then, you know, having uh, Hopper and, and Moltz and stuff like that. You know, off of the, we kind of knew the looming presence of the of the villains. So we would just have to say, how are they all different? And, you know, when when you cast a voice, then it then, then it shapes it even more. So, like, I knew who Dave Foley was and Julie Dreyfus and, you know, but like like in my uh, what I had was like uh, I knew Richard Kind, who played Moult, Hopper's brother. I knew him from Second City in Chicago and I knew him from I knew who he was. I knew his voice. And he was such a great voice. And he wasn't a big character at the beginning of the movie. I mean, he was just this, like, you know, the sidekick, the dumb sidekick brother. <clears throat> and so I was just, um, I was writing scenes. I was writing one with Bob Peterson and uh, Joe Ramp. And, and uh, I would try to write, because they would be boarding stuff. And I would just try to flesh out scenes a little more. And in them, I was just finding funny or ironic stuff for Moult to say that would frustrate Hopper. And and these guys started to like it. They started to like it. <clears throat> and I wrote the one thing, if you can remember in Bug's Life, it's like um, where Moult just blurts out how Hopper went down the mouth of a, of a bird. He's kicking and screaming, and now, oh, my God, and he's like, Moult? You know, it's like, you know, the, the family member tells too much. So, um I just wrote that on a whim. I just started to, and then Andrew and those guys just all started laughing. So then that's how Molt started to <clears throat> sort of build out. And then there was a point just going off on Bugs Life, but going off, uh, there was a point in there where all of a sudden I go, man, I could, because at the end, all the grasshoppers were sort of going to get the same treatment that Hopper got. And I go, I kind of like Molt. <laughs> and everybody is like, yeah, he's kind of a lot of fun now. And I just said, well, what if he joined the circus at the end? You know, and th that, that was just like, is that like in passing? And then everybody's sort of thinking about it. And his character arc just kind of changed a little bit. And it just seemed like, yeah, of course he, you know, and it helps the story and all that sort of stuff. But it, that all came from, you know, writing for a voice that I knew and, you know, when you hear the voice, you know, that's for me. When I hear the voice, I it, it helps create the the uh, sort of the 3D image of the character. Like, you know, in, in New Groove, when I when I heard Patrick Warburton, I knew Patrick Warburton would be Kronk. I just knew how I would write for him. You know, so when you do that thing for Atlantis, you know, Michael Fox, you know, you just know, you know, he's Marty McFly. He's, you know, I mean, you just know who Michael Fox is. And then we, we got James Garner, you just, those pieces start to fall into place. And then Don Novello, you know, I wrote a lot of Don Novello stuff, you know, uh, uh, Vinny and, um, and those things just come from hearing their voices. And then, and again, very generous, you know, the directors that let me, you know, come on the floor and, and uh, reshape and rewrite, you know, uh, during the recording sessions, because, you know, I, 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 I'm assuming you have this from other people, Kurt and Gary or Tab or somebody like that, is that, you know, you come in with a script to record. So what we want to do is we want to come down and lay down the lines that we've all agreed on before this, just so that we can have a cohesive uh, story points. But if during the course of the, you know, it depends on every director, if during the course of the, of the session, all of a sudden something sparks or somebody realizes something or or uh, suggestion is made and you veer off and you kind of follow a path, you know, you do that afterwards. You, you make sure you get the stuff that you came there for. And then, then, you know, if you're lucky and you have some extra time, you then try to explore uh, maybe different ways of saying lines or different lines in general or different, you know, sort of attitudes. And, and then the directors get to go back and have choices. And then you, as they're building with the editor, they're building, I like to give everybody choices. You know, I would, if I wrote a line for you, I'd write it for you to do it five, same line, five different ways. Right. And that way 
what line, whatever line sparks the most for the time needed. And then, and then, you know, and then we can build off of that. So there's, there's, I mean, I could, there's a lot of examples of that. If your character only has one or two scenes or, you know, has a scene and then doesn't have a scene for 50 minutes, they got to pop every time, right? Like the Audrey stuff. I wrote the stuff about her being a fighter, you know, her sister being a fighter. I wrote that little run and, you know, all that sort of stuff, all that campfire stuff we rewrote, you know, and you had to like nail who everybody was right off the bat. You know, somebody like Cookie is very funny. And uh, of course, we wrote tons of dialogue for Cookie. You know, we just had more than enough for <laughs> Cookie so he could have his own movie. Cookie and Packard and Vinny could have had their own movie. I'm telling you, there was so much stuff for those guys. Those, I think people characters. would love to still see that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, it was really funny. I mean, you know, yeah. you get Don DeBello on set and, you know, <laughs> I just wrote all this stuff. He goes, you know, he got the things and he goes, oh, you know, dynamite and the paper clips. You know, he was just like, and he, you know, the big ones, you know, office I supply. love him. He is, yeah. He's yeah. the so, nicest guy ever. <laughs> right. He was really great. Right. I wanted to, uh, we'll get back to Atlantis in this in a sure. second, because I kind of wanted to end with that. But sure. the one thing I was rewatching this week was the sweat box, which for Disney oh. fans who <laughs> do not know what it is, right. <laughs> it's a documentary that Sting's wife made about the process of the Emperor's New Groove being made into right. a, mil a movie, basically. It started as Kingdom of the Sun, and right. uh, then it made its way to Emperor's New Groove. And it also celebrated its 20 years last year. So yeah. um, it was so much fun to watch it again. Well, first of all, it is a painful experience for everybody who was involved. Obviously, when you start with the film, it's not always going to be 100% what it originally was at the beginning. But right. it's so interesting and fun to see the excitement that you all have about nailing a scene, nailing a song, um, right. just getting the right type of animation. So you could see there was so much love and craftsmanship that was going into the original film. And, and right. there's this one scene where you guys were about to go into the first um, viewing party of, of Kingdom of the Sun and Kingdom they talked to you a little bit about how you feel about it and you you know you're obviously nervous and right. and then the the heads of the company are like okay the story's not working but we got two segments of the story that do work the love song and the llama llama song right. so right. can you tell me a little bit about that 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 entire process because it seemed it was very very painful <laughs> okay so um yeah i was um i'm trying to think i was i was working on atlantis i get wait i'm trying to think where that came in right they all kind of overlap a little bit for me you know because i was working on all of them right i had a really unique contract where i i was on so like an old studio contract they said they gave me a weekly salary you know and they said you can work on as many things as you want and um and as many things as they wanted me to work on right so so anyway um i came on uh kingdom had been uh kingdom had been in development for like over a year when i got on it and irene mecky was the original writer uh or the writer that i was working with and who i knew really well and um you know was a prince and a pauper i don't you, you know the original story, right? It was a Prince and the Pauper sort of thing. An arrogant prince sneaks out and his his evil um, sort of sorceress, you know, Yzma wanted to turn. It was a really complicated storyline. Uh, wanted to turn the block out the sun. <laughs> Do you know, you know this whole thing, right? So you see, he blow, blocked out the sun. And when you would block out the sun, she would turn beautiful again and all her old lovers would come back and she would reign again supreme. And then the so so this uh, simple sort of farm boy who who switched places with the emperor and the emperor was supposed to be poisoned, turned into a llama. And this this farm boy who was played actually in the original thing by Owen Wilson um, had to sort of summon all these courage and go against the Smith and try to rope the sun and bring the sun back through and bring light back to the world. It was a great, it was huge. It was, uh, you know, Roger Allers was, you know, is a genius sort of like a uh, creative spirit. And uh, he had this massive idea 
And it was almost too much. You know, I mean, I'm just, you know, it was if you look back on it now, it was like there was a lot of things going on. And it's uh, like a term that I like to use. There was a lot of story math going on. Like, you know, when you watch a movie, you go, oh, this guy's going to do this in order to do this or this and then happy ending or whatever it is. There was that like times three. There was a lot of stuff going on to because it was such a big idea. And it was such a beautiful setting and all that sort of stuff, the myth and all that stuff. And so I was brought on uh, because it was getting sort of dark and and uh, and and Don Hahn brought me on. I knew Roger and a bunch of people on the uh, on the show. And um, Don brought me on. He says, we just need some, you know, work on the, you know, the comedy. And, you know, they, we had David Spade, who was the em- the arrogant emperor. I was going to rewrite some of his stuff. And then, you know, I would rewrite for Owen and, you know, just try to, along the lines, just try to do it. And, you know, in that time, the co-director of the movie was Mark Dindle. And that's where I met Mark Dindle. And I met cr- young swordboard guy, Chris Williams, who became a famous director and the great storyboard guy. And um, so, you know, you meet a lot of people along the way and, you know, fantastic crew and everything. And so when we were doing this, it was going along and, and, you know, you know, I would be given assignments and I would fix them and, and then, you know, everything would get pieced together and you just would sit there in, in a screening. And I remember one point just saying to Mark, just like, I am a little bit confused with what we're doing, you know, with the story. And I said, and we're working on the movie. It was too ambitious. Right. And I said, how is a five-year-old kid going to, that was my thought. Like we have to like water this down. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It made me just like thin it out in order to get just a cohesive arc and just follow that through. Now, as you know, if you saw the movie The Sweat Box, there was a there was a documentary crew following following us around because Sting had written six original songs and it was it was Roger's follow up to Lion King. So there's a lot of things teed up in this thing to be, you know, let's follow them in a documentary. So, yeah, it was a crazy as you see, if you watch The Sweat Box, it was an insane time. But when it became New Groove, when it became our movie, um, that that was that was a freedom. It's just, it's going to sound crazy. The fact that we had no time was so freeing because nobody from the studio could stop us <laughs> in a way they couldn't, um, they couldn't like throw things out and overanalyze things. They, we had to like, you know, um, I would write a scene, Mark would read it. He'd give me notes. I'd rewrite the scene. This is all in one day. He'd rewrite the scene. I'd rewrite it within the day. I, at the still within that day, we'd hand it off to a storyboard artist and, you know, we would want to see like roughs of it like two days later. And then right after we'd hand that off, I'd s- sit down with Mark and I'd start writing the second scene. And we would just do this thing where we'd overlap like this. And I was rewriting every scene or sequence I would write. I would usually write if I were working on it, write it twice within the day. And then we would have these group reads and or with Steve Anderson, who was our historian, Randy Fulmer and Mark and I. And it was a small group and we would just kind of rough it. And then Steve would hand it off to one of his storyboard guys. And then we would just have to move. You couldn't there, there's no fact here. You couldn't sit there and go down a path. You had to figure out the path and, and they go, is it right? Is it wrong? And vet it really quickly. That, that, um, was, that was completely unheard of for an animated film to be done like right. this because it was a certain date that it was held to. Just yes. crazy. And right. on the other hand, you have Atlantis, the Lost Empire, which is doing quite swell. <laughs> Nothing really bad going on over there. <laughs> and, no, uh, no, no. I mean, that was <laughs> that was that was that was crazy because I I would go from one meeting to the next, right? I mean, yeah. I would you know I'd write crazy myself to Cru- calm. Cusco and I'd <laughs> hand it off and I'd walk over to Kurt and Gary and they were all they had all these all this artwork and they had subs <laughs> and stuff and the crew was all figured out and all that stuff. And I was like, what the heck's going on? I mean, literally on fire over here, this thing, these guys are, you know, Don Hahn is having, you know, like appetizers, like literally a buffet appetizer, like little mini, mini hot dogs. And, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm not kidding. Every Friday, Don Hahn 
it, his pod, you know, they had pods in the animation building. And every Friday is like, you know, around 430, you would start to smell like food cooking. You would smell it and it would be wafting down the halls. And, and then you would hear music and then you would hear laughing. And it was Don Hahn's pod, you know, it was him. And, you know, he'd have a bar there and he'd have you know, you know, mini, mini hot dogs and, and, you know, and finger food and <laughs> music. And I'm literally, my eyes are spinning. You know, I just came out of like, we're just trying to put a movie together. Now, Don <laughs> was our executive producer on, on New Groove. So he knew what was going on. So he's like, you need to drink like, or whatever. He would just come, by, <laughs> you know, and, um, oh and so Kirk, Gary, uh, myself, Don Hahn and, I don't know. And then there was a, a, a script a woman, a Sherry uh, Judson was there on that. And we got into her one day. We laughed so hard. I thought Don Hahn was going to die. And Gary trials out because Gary, I don't, you know how he does those little drawings, those little doodles. Have you seen him? Yes, do that? Yes, right? I've seen a lot of them. Yes. <laughs> all right. Well, he would just, I've been in a lot of rooms with him. So, you know, we're all talking about a thing and he'll just draw this thing up and he'll just slide it to you. And it's so cutting and it's so funny. And we would laugh. So our, and it was all stuff, of course, that we couldn't put into Atlantis. Right. It was it was like, it was all about it was all about, you know, those guys uh, that were sort of like the stormtroopers at the second half of the show. They're all talking. They're all talking like this. Right. You know, that that. And we so people would come by and it would be me, myself, Kirk, Gary, John all sitting around the table going, I don't know. What do you think we should do? And we were just for hours, just hours. Anytime we would get stuck, so we would go, okay. let's." And we would try to think of a scene for those guys. Like why, like those guys are never really talked about. <laughs> anyway, I, so yeah, so that was the spirit w which was going on. I mean, it was, it was so fun to go in with, you know, with Kirk and Gary on that one. And uh, those guys were just so easy, you know. They were just they're, they're two they're two actually uh, you know artists story that like an, animator storyboard you know guys, you know they had those visions and then they were funny. They're both so funny and then Don's <laughs> hilarious. And so and but now here we're doing a like a like a guys and guns you know trucks and tanks and all this you know cool stuff Mike Mignola thing and it was like. So it was like it was like, you know, being, you know, 12 year old boys again, like, let's do this. <laughs> Wouldn't it be awesome? Did you have right. like a favorite particular line from the film? Because there's so many people in this Facebook group that we have with like 27,000 people and they're quoting all right. these lines every day. So what is one of your right. your favorites? Oh, God, you know, that's that's one of those weird ones when you're like, uh, which of my children do I love the most? No, <laughs> Um uh, I love, you know, it was funny. Uh, you know, you love, you love, um, you know, the Vinny stuff was funny because it was just sort of irreverently, I, you know, sarcastic or ironic, you know, you know, I loved all his stuff. And then you like, you know, you know, which, you know, it was just nice. It was teeing up, you know, uh, Michael Fox just to go, look at this is this, this, look at this column. It was carved in like millions, hundreds of thousands of years or whatever it was. And he goes, hey, I made a bridge. It took me like what, ten seconds? You know, um, those kind of <laughs> ideas. Those those lines are really fun. Those were really fun. And I'm trying to think of what else. You know, oh, you know, Packard stuff. You know, like it was always funny. Like because the first time I just the first time she says we're all gonna die, like that. <laughs> oh, that was one thing. And then the other one was, it was a riff in the room that I think I had with somebody and it was like when the whole ship is going to hell. Right. And, and I wrote, she's like, uh, he, he took the he suitcase left, Marge. He, he took a suitcase. I don't think he's coming back. You know, it's just like, and then, then, it, then the funny thing is like, and it's like Packard. She goes, I gotta go. It's all that sort of stuff of like how <laughs> Packard was on kind of different level than everybody else. It was like, she could care less. And then, <laughs> We just did those funny things where like work at the beginning is doing something and you just hear commander, commander, com what is it? It was all that sort of stuff. You were just, <laughs> it was just insane that they're doing this really like, like you know, work delivery. Stuff. 
Right, right. But he's like has to deal with her or Cookie or Mole. I mean, because they don't like, work. Like you wouldn't think that these personalities would work well, no, but they know no, each other so all, well. They do. They're the best of the best. And I remember, you know, those <laughs> things that those like those. Um, you know, when they throw those things down in front of Whitmore, like here's or in front of Milo, here's your crew. I mean, I remember having to type those up. I mean, we had to think of like the backstories. There somewhere there's all these pages of, you know, bios, you know For them, yeah. And you know, like like coming up with the florist thing for Vinny, you know, that whole thing. <laughs> you know, it's like the corsages, you know, the ones for the wrist, you know. I just remember we were doing that. We had some of that stuff and then we had Don on the floor. So we were able to kind of work. That's what I'm talking about. We had to kind of like mold it to him. Mm -hmm. Collaborate and get it to the. Right. So because, you know, if you wrote it like, you know, I had this and this, I was making corsage. And, you know, but knowing him, he would be more specific, you know, like the ones for the wrist, you know, like and that boom, that was. You know, that all that the way he phrased it, we just sort of did it like, you know, so you write it and then you kind of rewrite it with him. Right. And you or say, could you say it like this? Could you say it like this? You know, it's a very funny thing. And you probably have seen over the years with people in animation is like if you really are a control freak, animation is the place for you. Right. <laughs> because you control every inch of it, every second, every inch of the screen has to be filled. So, you know, there can't there there really can be no mistakes. Like when an animated movie comes out, they go, "Oh, you know, we don't know what happened." Well, yeah, you everything was approved, right? Whereas, oh yes, in live, <laughs> like like in a live action movie, they go, "Well, you know, the sun was going down. We had to like go crazy. for it." That's we yeah. only we were leaving the next day. This is all. This is the best we could get, right? But animation, animation it's like to the is, point animation is like so hands-on and so many approvals and so many, you know, levels and layers to goes that you go, you have to really, you know, and if you've ever been in a session with these guys, you know, they're with a laser pointer and they're just pointing to different, can you make this sharper? Can you make the, you know, they're doing all this sort of, it really is sort of like, um, you know, a control freak stream. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean that in the best possible way, you know, like we're all kind of control freaks you know, like we all have our certain ways we want things done. Like as a writer, I want you to say it a certain way. I have it in my head. Worked on Nemo, right? You know that I worked on Finding Nemo. And um, one of the, to that point, there was a there was a line in it. We were recording uh, Albert Brooks, and um, and it was um, it was the scene where he drops uh, Nemo off at school, and. Um, the line and so, so some of the other fish say uh, hey you're a clownfish tell us a joke and so andrew had written a, like the bad joke that's in the movie you know a see an enemy walks up to a see whatever the other one is right so he had that joke in there like and it, it, the idea was that the joke was just supposed to, he was supposed to tell it was supposed to fall flat okay that was originally written that way and I, we were in the recording session and i'm looking at this and albert brooks is like 6 feet away from me and I go, oh, my God. I just came, flashed to me. I said, what if he tries to deconstruct the joke? And I just say that to Andrew and to Bob Peterson. And Albert Brooks goes, oh, my God, that's funny. And so Andrew's like, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? I go, it's a guy who thinks he can tell a joke but can't tell a joke. And so Albert Brooks launched into that joke that was on the page. And he did a riff where he tried to – he says, uh, okay, first of all, uh, a sea enemy, uh, 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 you know, walks. Well, no one's walking. They're all talking. And he just takes apart. <laughs> the, like he takes apart the joke. He goes, uh, it was actually told to me by official. Uh, that doesn't have anything to do with it. But the, here's the, and he just did it. And he did this deconstruction of the joke. I'm not kidding you for five minutes. He just went, never stopped talking. <laughs> and we are, we're, we're like six, eight feet away from him, like holding our mouth. Andrew Stanton's is blonde, you know, and he's got really fair skin. He was just bright red. He was just bright red. Where he <laughs> so funny. Our eyes are bugging. He's turning. Andrew's turning away, and you can just see Albert looking at us. He knows he's killing us, making us laugh, and we're not, and we have to hold it. And and then and then he stops, and we all burst out laughing. Oh my god, that was so funny, you know. 
Oh, but so, and then of course I'm the writer. I just like, I, you know, I just go, Oh, I like the part you said about the fisherman. He goes, Oh, do you think that was funny? I go, yeah, it's like how you kind of turned it around or made some point. He, he jumps behind the mic and does another four or five minute version of, the, of deconstructing the joke. <laughs> and it worked out great. But that's one of those uh, sort of examples of how, when you write something that a certain way on the page and we rewrite it and we read it in the room and then we bring it to the recording stage and then I hear a celebrity or the celebrity voice or whoever the voices say it and I go, oh, the nuance is all different. And oh, then just something can spur it on. Now, sometimes it doesn't. and We just get the lines and we get out and it's great and it works fantastic. But other things like Don Novello was a great person for Atlantis. And, you know, he was just, you know, he's from that. He's a great writer. He's done improv. He, he knows that character really well. You know, that that type of Italian guy, he knows him. And they said, you you know, we just kept saying, you know, you're you love to blow up things. It's just it's your passion. And he's so and as a person, he's very quiet. So he's just like. He's like, I just, I love the boom. I love it. I love it. You know, he was just saying this stuff all the time <laughs> because he was saying it with like the passion of like his, like, he said like it was an Italian grandfather, like talking about pasta. He's so or perfect. Or, right. He really is. Like, I can't believe it's been 20 years since the film has been released and we're going to be having a celebration later in the year. And right. um, hopefully Dave is going to be a part of it. So yeah, we'll, sure. we'll share more later on my pages. But before right. we close our interview, I have three Disney themed questions. I okay. asked to every single person. So we'll start with the Donald one of the fab three. So as a child, what Disney film was your favorite to see in the movie theater? You know, there was some cool stuff about Dumbo. I mean, I mean, I know because they would re-release it, you know, into the theaters. Just the, you know, it's all that wish fulfillment of being able to fly. And our goofy question, what Disney okay. character do you think would be your best friend if you met them in person? Um, Kronk. Finally, our Mickey sure. question. Um, if I asked you to name any Disney song at this very moment, what immediately comes to mind? It's High Hope. You know, off to work we go. I can't, hopefully we'll have you back on the show again. I can't wait to celebrate Atlantis a little bit more with you and the rest of the crew. Yeah. So thank you so much for being a part of the show. This was a blast. Okay. Well, listen, I'm so glad we got a chance to finally talk. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and we'll, um, we'll go off to our own secret lab right now. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Pull you know the lever. When, you, you know that when you and I hang up from this, we're both going back to work. Yes. Somewhere. That's yeah, at some point. <laughs> yeah. We're all gonna die.